Hi everyone and welcome to Cambridge Architectural Researchers Online Car Forum. I'm Hannah Baker, one of the directors at CAR. CAR is an interdisciplinary company with researchers in energy, buildings and cities and risk and also has practicing engineers. The motivation behind setting up the CAR Forum is to give early career researchers and or professionals an opportunity to present and discuss their work on a particular theme to those in practice and academia. Today, that theme is Reviving Shrinking Cities. Helen Mulligan, another director at CAR, will give a brief overview of the ReCity project, and then we'll have four presentations, approximately 10 minutes each, from our early career researchers. This will be followed by a question and answer session, where you can either raise your hand and ask your question out loud, or if you prefer to type the question in the chat, and then Helen and I can read it out for you. You can also type this in as we go along, but we'll probably uh, save them till the end to read out. These can also be comments or pieces of advice for the researchers, as most are presenting preliminary results. And from my own PhD experiences, it's useful to get different input at this stage. Most of the talks are being recorded, but we'll stop this when it comes to the questions and comments. And from there, I will pass over to Helen. Thank you very much um, for that, Hannah. I'm, I'm going to give um, a quick overview of what our um, ReCity project is all about. As Hannah mentioned, it's um, uh, all to do with shrinking cities. Um, Perhaps um, you're familiar with the concept, perhaps not. It's a very common um, uh, phenomenon worldwide. Uh, in fact, one city in six is estimated to be losing population. And up until about um, 15 or 20 years ago, it was quite a neglected area in planning studies, which um, tended to concentrate on what we call the growth paradigm, you know, worrying about the, the stresses that are imposed by increasing urbanization and really not paying much attention to the areas that were by comparison um, shrinking. But a number of um, researchers realized that similar um, signs and phenomena were emerging in shrinking cities in, in different regions, different countries, and had a hunch that international comparisons between um, Latin America, the US, um, Asian cities, European cities, um, could uh, produce some quite interesting um, comparative uh, results. So um, a group came together of um, people who were visiting scholars at the University of California in Berkeley at the time, um, including myself. I won't read out the, uh, the names of the, of the guilty parties here, but uh, a number of us are involved in this current um, project um, 15 years later. Um, and we formed the uh, Shrinking Cities International Research Network. And uh, one of the uh, things that uh, our early discussions produced was a working definition of what a shrinking city is. And very briefly, it's not only suffering population decline, but they are accompanied by symptoms of economic crisis. So uh, we, as the International uh, Research Network, um, started working together in the longer term. We produced joint publications and we met up regularly at conferences. Um, we put in a number of research applications, some of which um, were bilateral projects that got funded. Uh, we set up uh, exchange visits and field trips between different academic institutions. And uh, several of our organizations, academic and otherwise, uh, participated in a EU funded network under the COST program. And following on from that, we received funding under the uh, Marie Curie Exchange pro Program um, with our project ReCity, um, Reviving Shrinking Cities. That's, this started in um, 2018, runs for um, four years. And one of the things that it does is to fund 13 um, PhD students in the different institutions um, and produces joint publications and there's a program of workshops and secondments and 
Importantly, um, one of our speakers today is based with us, that's Faiza. The other three are currently on secondment with us. But um, of course, COVID has happened in the middle of this program and has changed a lot of uh, what we're doing and put a lot of it online. So they are, have come to us for a virtual secondment for two weeks. And this is one of the major events within that. So just to say a little bit about the ReCity project, it focuses on four topic areas that you see um, at the top, conceptualizing shrinking smart, the governance of shrinking cities, um, greening and right-sizing issues for shrinking cities, and looking a little bit about um, how they might regrow in future. A number of the institutions involved, as you see, are um, universities in Porto, in Amsterdam, um, and in um, Ernest in Paris, one of the Grand Ecole. Um, but also there are um, partners in the project who are hosting students such as ourselves and Spatial Foresight, which is a, a research consultancy in Luxembourg. Um, there are also um, partners in the project who are not um, hosting students themselves, but providing secondment opportunities and um, input to some of our workshops and the other activities. Um, you see um, uh, Kent State University in the US is one of those, and the Nomura Research Institute, private institute in, in, um, in Tokyo, and um, uh, public agencies like NIMED in the Netherlands, and um, private companies like um, Fresh, which is a German company. So, as I said, there are 13 um, PhD students, early stage researchers within the project. Here they all are. And these um, rather whizzy zooming lines show which institutions those students are going to uh, for their secondments. So as you can see, there's a very dense network of international exchange uh, inside the program, which um, facilitates in particular, um, not only exposure to new ideas, but also the opportunity to carry out um, comparative case studies, which many of our students are in fact doing. So just to give a little bit of a background to shrinking cities in Europe, um, this was a, an overview um, in, in a certain time period of those um, in the blue colors, uh, which um, regions which are shrinking and um, in, the, in the brighter colors, in the orange and red, those that um, are experiencing growth. And you can see that by and large, many of the, the shrinking uh, regions are to the east, um, the, in Southeast Europe and in the Baltic States and in the um, uh, former Eastern Germany. Um, many of these uh, demographic changes have come about uh, in the aftermath of um, reunification of Germany and um, post-socialist uh, regimes becoming established in many of those countries. Um, also, we see more peripheral regions of Europe in, in Scandinavia, in the north, and um, northern Spain, for example, parts of Portugal in the south, which are also, um, over this period, had suffered demographic decline. But it has to be said that um, uh, many of these causes uh, have very diverse causes, a um, number of different factors there, and also cases um, uh, differ by uh, where they are in the shrinking cycle, whether they've been uh, shrinking for a, over a long period of time, or we can see a more cyclical phenomenon there. Uh, whether the um, issue is um, essentially rejected by policy makers and um, the growth paradigm is still very much in people's minds, or, or whether in other cases uh, decline has been accepted, population loss has been accepted, and the more positive aspects of um, new opportunities are being explored and embraced. Um, so every case uh, in these uh, within our group is is different, and our um, early stage researchers are going to be uh, telling you some detail about that in their studies. 
So for example, um, if we look at um, that uh, criterion of whether shrinkage is continuous or not, you can see a lot of difference um, in where the studied regions are in that, um, in that regard. Again, you can see more of the kind of long-term shrinkage. The, um, the blue colors are in, tend to be in Eastern Europe, um, but um, short-term shrinkage also um, seen in many of the countries that we're looking at, uh, including, the, um, including the UK. So really, that uh, that 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 just gives an uh, an overview of some of the um, the long term trends, if you like, um, and the wider geographical trends. Um, the cities are at different stages in their dynamic topology. There are different causes, and there are different local approaches. And um, we're starting to see in some cases what may be making a difference and why that is. But again, I have to um, reiterate that our, um, our group of early stage researchers, who you see here gathered together at a poster session in a conference in 2019, they, they're now um, approximately two years into their research projects. Um, what they're going to say um, is uh, at an early, uh, early stage in development of their, of their dissertations. And um, I'm, I'm sure that um, comments um, from our audience members, um, both in discussion after their presentations, and um, if, if you're interested to follow up um, by email and other means, um, uh, your comments will be very, um, very welcome by our presenter group today. So um, I'm going to turn the floor over to them. Uh, as I said, we have four presenters. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Faiza Akai, and then um, Solène Lebon, then Norma Shemshat, and finally, Olivia Lewis. And I'm going to introduce each of them um, as they um, start their presentation. So handing over now to Faiza. Faiza is, um, as I said, based with us in CAR. Um, she um, originates from South Africa, um, and she's going to talk to us today about approaches to urban shrinkage while improving flood resilience, a dilemma. Hello, everybody. I'm a town planner trained in uh, town and regional planning and design. And today I really want to talk to you about flood resilience and these flood resilience that's located in areas that are impacted by long term urban shrinkage. So the focus today will be a bit about more the UK context, not just because we are going through this economic resurgence now post lockdown, but also being this potential future leader in improving resilience. And like Helen mentioned, I'll be doing a comparative case study as well. So if we start from the beginning, all countries in the world have undergone urbanization. And urbanization, as we understand this, is to be the proportion of people living in the urban area. But the picture is not always uniform. Not all cities are growing, some are shrinking. Philip Oswald, one of the earlier pioneers in shrinking cities, writes in these publications that in the 21st century, shrinking cities will, sorry, cities will have surges of this growth and shrinkage. So having this periods of cyclical uh, decline. So what is this urban shrinkage and how, how does it look like? Since the pandemic emerged in December, 2019, millions of people around the world have moved out of cities. For some office work has shifted online, like what we're doing now, allowing staff to, rework, to work remote. Now, according to a recent study, UK's urban population may have shrunk by 1.3 million 
and around 700,000 residents have left London during this time. There are also decline of urban areas we, which was once dominated by the single industry, whether textile or fishing, these industries have lost the production capacity. And as a result, many people have lost their jobs and companies have gone bust. We also have this shrinkage of land use in particularly industry types. So this decline of traditional uh, industries to more greener industries, more knowledge intensive industries. Uh, most of these pictures, as you can see, is actually from British examples. But the single most important change we are seeing is climate change. And this is becoming a new parameter influencing settlement development patterns and these urbanization. So Climate Change Committee in the UK now has listed flooding and coastal change as really one of these great climate change risks for the UK. Not just for now, but also the future. So what is certain is that cities need to start planning for climate ready infrastructure that is equitable, creates green jobs, but also improves the local environment. But first, we need to understand what is meant by urban shrinkage. It is this multi dimensional phenomena encompassing this decline in demographic, economic, social and cultural and that of the built environment. So I thought today that I'll share some international examples of projects, projects that's really focusing on improving this long term resilience. There's some examples of shrinking cities here and there's some of non shrinking cities, which is the growing cities. Venice, a historic city has lost more than a third of its residents since the 1950s and now is putting in loads of investments um, in flood defenses. Then we have the sponge city that uses this integrated urban water management strategy and has this combination of green and gray infrastructure. Another example is this multi-purpose flood detention basin that is to deal with river levels and peak discharges. This project in Tokyo gives us an example of how we can combine land use and flood hazards. Here they proposed a new sports venue, a recreational area and a conservation area. So this project really gives us a good example on how we can bring together development and flood protection. But probably one of the most renowned project proposals that we know is of the dry line. It's this 12 kilometer long infrastructure barrier that incorporates public space with a high water barrier that includes parks, bicycle shelters, skateboards, and ramps. The, this all has additional benefits for the city. So the design here is not just to create this great uh, seawall, but to integrate the city and the water development. So what can we take back from all these different examples? So if we had to summarize the five key points, we would say that community involvement and co-design and learning was very prominent in the successful implementation and maintenance of these projects. Then also demographic changes can affect this long-term flood resilience when planning for infrastructure and services. So if you have a city that has largely aging population, you would adapt your infrastructure to suit the needs of the citizens. Then also innovation in flood suitable uses, looking at cost effective ways whether temporary or permanent solutions for cities, whether it's in shrinking or regrowing cities. Then multi-level and multi-sector governance approach with institutional alignment was key in this examples. And to ensure flood resilience, these are projects over 10, 20, 30 years, even 50 years, long-term financial investment was needed. In the UK, over 5.2 million homes and businesses in England are currently at risk of flooding and more will become threatened in the future. The main central government vehicle for directly flood, um, funding flood schemes is the environmental agency. Now the government has just announced this new six year program of investment in flood and coastal defenses 
of 5.2 billion pounds across 2000 projects in the UK. But how is urban shrinkage being understood in the UK? The profile is quite distinctive in that it has a relative decline rather than absolute decline, which is quite common in European countries. So these two recent studies shows a very contrasting picture on where these cities of relative decline are located. The figure on the right indicates this relative decline between over 1951 and 2013. And in a nutshell, if we compare the two, we can see that these cities have long-term social and economic challenges that has a heritage legacy. So UK has also a long history of growth strategies on trying to address these urban shrinkage challenges. And the focus here is really on the Yorkshire and the Humber region. And the latest funding that they've received now is this, uh, the Freeport, um, in the Freeport um, sector. This is where tax incentives to encourage development um, along the Humber. And this is said to create over 7,000 much needed jobs in the area. And you can see that quite a lot of the land uses that's being proposed in the surrounding areas is being linked to this industry to serve as a supporting use to, the, to this new renewable energy cluster in the UK. So just briefly in terms of the methodology, I'll be collecting a range of qualitative and quantitative data to examine what is this link between urban shrinkage and flood resilience over longer periods. And the use will be a scenario planning to, to offer suggested solutions on how urban development issues uh, can occur. So the two cities that I'd like to compare is Northeast Lincolnshire and Bremerhaven in Germany. The Northeast Lincolnshire forms part of the Humber side of that port area. And the area has an important cultural history as being one of the first docks in the UK developed by the Grimsby Haven Company in the late 1700s. Bremerhaven along the River Vesa has, the long, has a long history of shipbuilding and container industries and was once also a departure point for European immigration. I found that these cities were engaging in a variety of strategies. It turns out that both cities, although similar in terms of their level to flood risk and coastal erosion, were engaging in quite different approaches in terms of rebuilding and regrowing after those periods of earlier decline. And you can see that although these cities have lost population in the past, they are still undergoing the cyclical decline and certainly are not stable or not in a stable growing situation like most cities. So the two spatial strategic plans that's really looking at this long-term growth within the area um, is mostly focused along the port side. And in Northeast Lincolnshire in the left, we can see that a lot of the um, in industry um, is being located along the coast. And on the outskirts, you have this peripheralization of um, different suburbs. Whereas Bremerhaven on the right has a bit more of a compact development. So what was found here now is that urban shrinkage in both cities over long term is shaped by this industrial history and that today it's shaped also by the skills level and the location of the city regional um, and the national scale. So to sum up, the main difference is the role of the state and the market in really creating this resilience of the city. So what does this mean if you are intensifying land use activity within these areas and what does it mean for the urban design of these areas and how are these built environments being changed over time and to end off here i'd like to leave you with a quote by david attenborough that real success can only come if there is a change in our societies and in our economics and in our politics thank you for your time Thank you very much, uh, Faiza. Um, thank you for um, cramming a lot of ideas into a, a short space of time.
Um, I'm sure um, there are in many interesting points that um, audiences would, uh, uh, audience members would like to uh, uh, address later. But now we're going to move on to Solène Le Bon, who is um, French by origin, but is now based in the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And she's going to talk about coping with urban shrinkage, roles of local social networks and place attachment. Solène. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Solène Le Borgne, and uh, I'm going to present my work on uh, the role of social capital, uh, especially in coping with urban shrinkage. And the PowerPoint dot doesn't seem to be moving. No, it didn't move. Um, just try resharing again, see if it moves then. Not yet. It moves now. Okay. Great. So, yeah, I will start with some um, background uh, information on the social dimension of urban shrinkage. And then I will briefly present my methodology and my case studies. And um, finally, I will get to introduce some of uh, my, the first results of my research. But let's start immediately with the social dimension of urban shrinkage, because yes, this phenomenon has many social implications. Um, and well, one of the main manifestations of urban shrinkage, of course, is out migration. The people are leaving the place. Um, but this outmigration is socially selective. It primarily concerns younger and uh, higher educated residents. And as a result, um, it has implications for the socioeconomic structure of the population. Primarily, the, um, there is an increasing proportion of people, um, industry workers and employees uh, in the share of population groups. And maybe more generally, also one of the main uh, consequences of urban shrinkage is the impoverishment of the population. So because of all these social and spatial changes that are very, very much affecting shrinking cities, I first assumed that uh, in this specific context, social capital was likely to be transformed and could become more relevant. Um, and by social capital, um, what I mean, so I have a very abstract, I'm using a definition by Bourdieu, which is very abstract, but to speak in more concrete terms, um, the way I operationalized social capital is with, um, with three pillars. The first is social participation. So this is mainly social activity, social interactions. Then social capital is also composed of the social infrastructure. So these are the social networks, basically. And finally, it is also composed of social cohesion. Um, the shared, these are the shared norms and value, values that get the, all the individuals to st stick together as a community. So this led me to formulate two research questions. And the first of these research questions is on the consequences of urban uh, shrinkage on social capital. But then in turn, I also interrogate the role of social capital on the people's capacity to cope with the consequences of uh, urban shrinkage. And so this is the second research question. And in this, uh, well, my hypothesis is that social capital um, can give the people access to alternative resources, alternative to economic resources, for example. And in turn, this can influence how people are able to cope with the consequences of urban shrinkage. So how, how do I answer these two research questions? Um, I chose to go for a mixed methods approach, which means combining two very different quantitative and qualitative approaches. So I conducted an ethnographic study and a survey, at, and I combined them. And I studied two French medium-sized shrinking cities, Nevers and Dieppe. And uh, they are both approximately 30,000 inhabitants. 
And more importantly, both of them at municipal level, uh, both of them lost more than 25% of their population since 1975. So now I'm getting to my initial results. Um, and first, the consequences uh, of urban shrinkage on social capital. And yes, it turns out that indeed, uh, in this specific context, social capital is facing different threats and also some transformations. So um, urban shrinkage, it impacts social capital, both in terms of social networks, but also the access to social networks. And uh, first, one of these threats to social capital is related to the out-migration of residents. So for the residents who didn't migrate, who remained uh, in place, this results in um, a dismantling or dislocation of social networks. Um, and it has consequences um, for different, social, different kinds of social networks and different population groups as well. So one example is family networks. Um, since selective out-migration concerns primarily younger residents, it impacts family networks, uh, which are weakening. And the population groups that are more affected are older people, uh, basically the people whose children have left the area. And uh, more specifically also, the people living alone are more affected than couples. And for life expectancy reasons, these are more, of, more often women. So for these people, these women in particular, who are uh, most affected by this consequence, it is many, mainly, mainly felt in terms of um, increased isolation and increased loneliness. But then there are also consequences in terms of access to social ties, access to the social structure. And for example, one, run, one of the respondents explained how the drop in her financial means when she retired um, also meant a reduced access to opportunities for socialization. So sometimes, economic social capital has to be accessed, accessed through converting economic capital. In the most straightforward way, that means having to pay for social activities. And since impoverishment, as I said, is one of the main consequences of urban shrinkage, um, then we might assume that in this context, um, the, the, the social capital of individuals can be reduced. But then also, maybe, maybe as a consequence of these threats, there are also changes in how the social capital is constructed. So um, in this context, some traditional actors of social inclusion, they start to play an even more important role. For example, community centers. Uh, the community centers, they play a supporting role, um, a kind of social structure to rely on, and ultimately, they help to counterbalance the loss of social capital at individual level. So for example, for the people who are particularly isolated, sometimes for the reason that I just explained, um, the community centers provide an alternative way to build some social capital. So now I'm, I'm coming to the, the role of social capital in the capacity to cope with urban shrinkage. And the first results tend to confirm my initial hypothesis and to explain that, um, I'm, I, I'm, I will take one specific example of one of my case studies. Uh, I'm going to analyze the case of one respondent whom I call Anthony for, for this presentation. Uh, he's a young man in his 30s. He comes from a working class background and um, he left the city to study at university and then to start his career. But at some point, he decided to come back to his hometown. And this came at the cost of his professional trajectory because to co by coming back, he had to give up his job. He had reduced access to professional opportunities and he didn't get a new one. However, he has a very extensive localized social networks, network of friends and relatives. And he was asked to join the 
the list for the municipal election, and now he's a municipal delegate, and he acts, uh, he's acting as, as a reference between the neighborhood residents and the municipality, the politicians. So actually, coming back to his city, for him, that meant a trade-off in different forms of capital. Uh, he had a decrease in economic capital because he lost his job, but also a decrease in symbolic capital by, because by losing his job, he also lost some symbolic capital. Um, he, he, he lost his social status. But then he was able to use his local resources, his local social capital, and to convert that back into symbolic capital by regaining a social status, this time not as um, not as not through his profession, but through his political responsibilities. So this is one of the way, ways in which this mechanism of using local social capital is used. Uh, so these were some of the first results of my analysis. And um, maybe to open up the debate and to create a dialogue between the built environment and the social dimension, um, I suggest that we can reflect on the role of meeting places in cities and maybe in particular, let's talk about their gendered characteristics. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Solène, for that um, very interesting presentation and uh, then the examples that you shared with us. Um, now let's go on to uh, Norma's presentation. Um, Norma also um, coming from um, a social sciences perspective. Um, she's um, she's comes from Germany, based um, academically at the uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. Um, I think she's actually speaking to us now from Germany, where she's uh, based to conduct her, her case studies. Um, but unlike many of us, um, is um, commuting virtually to her. Um, her, her workplace uh, in Paris. So Norm is going to talk about the role of refugees in revitalizing, in revitalization, arrival and placemaking in shrinking cities. Thank you, Norma. That's right. Thank you so much, Helen. And thanks, Hannah, for organizing all of this. Thanks also to the others for those very first really good and interesting presentations. My presentation is dealing with a strategy against shrinkage. Um, but it's also really connecting to what Solène already said in terms of the social dimensions of shrinkage and in a way connects to what Helen said initially and to what um, Faisa said that they are all forms of shrinking cities basically. So like Faisa, I'm looking at um, post-industrial regions in my research. So I, I subtitled my presentation a bit provocatively into left behind places uh, or arrival spaces. So my um, overall interest is in the challenges and opportunities of this uh, strategy. And for this, I'd like to <clears throat> start with a very, yeah, as brief as possible introduction and um, connecting a bit to the um, definitions we have already um, heard today, give a um, working um, definition of the concept of refugee-centered revitalization very short peek into the literature, just you know, to be able to kind of explain my approach to the to the to the strategy, to then really move on immediately to some first very preliminary findings of my research in um, the U.S. city of Akron and the German city of Permacense as two examples of refugee-centered um, revitalization, and to then close um, with some preliminary. Um, conclusions, some remarks for the discussion. So what's uh, shrinking cities? So just a brief recap that it is indeed a, a, a multi-dimensional phenomenon that is um, really um, marked by these signs of structural crisis. And I just re-emphasize this because it, it matters when dealing with immigration and urban environments. Um, shrinkage effects possibly affect, uh, potentially affect um, integration processes on the ground. Um, they impact social group relations. So just this as a reminder and kind of a very broad setting and um, underlying assumption of my work. Um, what then is refugee-centered regeneration or revitalization? It's generally discussed in the literature. So there's not much literature on this, but when it's discussed in the literature, 
It's primarily discussed as a top-down strategy through which cities, primarily shrinking cities, present themselves as immigrant-friendly with the aim to attract new inhabitants, really targeted to, um, to migra um, new inhabitants with migrant backgrounds, forced migrants, um, ideally with entrepreneurial spirits. So it's really a strategy for the city to reinvent itself as an inclusive city, as a way to halt the demographic decline. Um, in my work, I do not only look at these strategies um, from the city, from top down, but I'm also looking at more informal processes of refugee-centered re revitalization, and which I'd like to call the more, let's say, refugee-driven revitalization. So just to bear in mind, it's, it's, a, it's an approach that can be top down, but bottom up as well. Just to recap, my general uh, research interest lies in the challenges of uh, two, but also opportunities of this strategy. And to place this a bit in the literature, I mean, it's well known that there's always been this relationship between human mobility and urban growth or decline. This is nothing new. Um, there's also extensive literature on immigration and the urban environment, but what is a bit complicated or what makes the whole approach I think very interesting is that shrinking cities are very much unlike growing metropolitan areas. And these metropolitan areas are what we have all our knowledge on immigrants and the urban environment from. So um, it's a bit this, this um, challenge and this curiosity of what actually happens in, to these processes of arrival, integration, um, negotiations of place and belonging under conditions of urban shrinkage. To understand these um, or to find an access to these processes from a literature perspective, um, there's help because there's emerging literature on so-called new immigrant destinations, small towns, rural areas, medium-sized cities that all help us to grasp the specificity, uh, specificities of, of um, um, shrinking cities. And there's uh, literature on very local, um, the complexities of the local arrival processes in general. And this is a bit where I'm, um, this is the entry point I'm trying to take, new immigrant destinations, arrival processes. And I think for this, the, the notion of the arrival infrastructure is very interesting as, and I quote, artifacts of urban mentality and social -material, uh, material expressions resulting from a variety of spatial agencies from below. Um, to just contextualize my fieldwork a little bit, so I'm, I'm time-wise, I'm placing my, my research in the long summer of migration and the years that followed. So the summer of 2016, when lots of um, forced migrants arrived in Europe. I think that's very interesting because right after we saw the really the, the, the split of the public discourse into an almost dichotomy between a welcoming culture and the construction of a refugee crisis. And we've seen in many European countries in the US some anti-refugee sentiments, um, ever increasingly tight border regimes in Europe, but also the US. But we also see, so with that, we see really how the urban environment is an ambivalent place and space for migrants. <clears throat> but connecting back to the city issue or topic, we also see that cities are in extremely, becoming extremely important actors in international migration management. So we see how with the rise in anti-refugee sentiments, lots of, or let's say national, uh, more restrictive politics, we saw how cities emerged as sanctuary cities, safe harbors, etc. What I find particularly interesting um, in looking at arrival under conditions of decline is that we have this really predominantly negative image and narrative on both shrinking cities and refugees. Going from the discursive level to the very material realities, we also have potential conflict over limited resources. But, and this is what a bit what um, Solen touched in her presentation, what has, been, what has been discussed in other work before, there's also potential for very, very strong civil society in these places. So it kind of brings us to the, the question if shrinking cities are potentially even more ambivalent environments. And with this, um, 
I'm moving right on to the field um, with insights from the US and Germany. I'm starting with Akron, um, <clears throat> the former rubber capital of the world. It's really experienced extremely rapid growth thanks to its uh, local rubber manufacturing, which provided materials for the emerging uh, automotive industry in the Great Lakes region in the US. Um, it um, shows, all the, but then when the industries went to the Southern states, so unlike in Europe, it didn't globalize entirely right away. It went from the um, Great Lakes region down to, to, to so, Southern US states. And with that, it experienced a pretty rapid demographic and economic decline. And today shows all of these structural signs of, of urban shrinkage. Um, whereas the general population went down, we also see a rise rather steep in the foreign born population. And this is not only thanks to, but partly thanks to uh, the location, the fact that there's a local refugee resettlement agency in the city. Um, and therefore we have at least 3,200 primary refugees um, living and resettled in Akron, predominantly in the Northern neighborhood. I'm just showing you a brief um, overview. So the Northern neighborhood, if you see my mouse, is this area. It's where the local agency, uh, the International Institute of Akron is located. It's also home to a bunch of initiatives on the neighborhood, but also city level. And it's a region that had high, high rates of vacant housing, which are now slowly really being filled through this process of refugee resettlement. Um, on, a more, on a larger scale, um, Akron is part of the Welcoming America network. It's part of the network Global Ties. Um, and lots of regional uh, uh, local agencies have connections to other cities in the region, be Cleveland or Pittsburgh, but also Kent or Cuyahoga Falls. So it's really an, a rather interesting example of, um, let's say, top-down refugee-centered revitalization. Moving on to Permasense, the German case study there, we have a bit of a um, different situation. The trajectory of growth and decline is very comparable. Also post-industrial cities city, um, was the shoe capital, not of the world, but of uh, Europe back then. So very steep growth, but equally steep decline when um, first the shoe manufacturing um, industry globalized, and then finally um, also US troops left the city. Again, all signs of structural crisis, but also uh, strong immigration, uh, forced immigration, especially since 2015, when um, Permacents um, took in uh, much more refugees than initially um, required by the national distribution key. This is how it works in Germany. <clears throat> so today there are 22.1 refugees per thousand inhabitants in, in Permacents. Um, and whereas there's no uh, citywide strategy to kind of manage this process, we see here, and this is the local um, pedestrian zone that used to be very um, emptied out, so to say. You see this in the upper left image, lots of vacant housing, uh, vacant shop fronts as well. We, this is really the region where lots of forced migrants um, found a home, um, started businesses, and really revive um, this center. And with this, these few images are moving on to my concluding remarks. We have two examples of shrinking cities that experienced revitalization through refugee communities, top down and bottom up. In both cases, low costs of living were uh, pull factors for the migrants. But we, so these are really great opportunities and needs further investigation. We also have a couple of challenges, which for example, is that housing is often of bad quality, which can lead to become a push factor for some. Um, and that the, the shrinking city socioeconomic characteristics tend to have a negative impact on social cohesion. So we have some intergroup conflict going on in both cases. And with this, I'd like to close with um, you know, raising a bit this question on how um, we can build, rebuild the urban environment in a way that fosters social cohesion so that these um, sorts of conflicts can be mitigated. So thank you so much for your time and attention.